the Middle East, and the United States are bound by history, shared interests, and hope for a peaceful and prosperous future. Today, we need these partnerships more than ever. In the face of growing challenges, we need to go beyond the headlines to understand each other and our shared future. Since 1946, MEI, the Middle East Institute, has been working to find solutions to the region's problems, build bridges, and promote dialogue through arts and education. What is the role of the United States? Our premier policy institute. A Syrian Kurdish artist. Our pioneering art gallery. And our dynamic education center make MEI an integrated think tank in the heart of Washington, D.C. Come to MEI and be inspired. Consider new voices and perspectives on Middle East policy. Interact with the region's artists, musicians, and filmmakers. Michaela Mabuki. Learn a new language and explore the region's history. We see a future where youth have hope and women are empowered. We believe the region can move past conflict to pursue peace and realize its full economic potential. Together, we can build a future where knowledge and understanding bring opportunity so that peace is possible and prosperity is shared. Please join us. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our viewers from around the world. I'm Vivian Salama, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to MEI's 74th Annual Awards Gala. Thank you so much for joining us for this first ever virtual gala, highlighting stories of resilience and innovation in these challenging times. And thanks also to our generous sponsors of this year's gala. Their support allows MEI to host events like this and welcome audiences from around the world. We have an exciting program ahead of us. We'll be hearing from speakers whose messages underscore what the global pandemic has made clear, how truly connected we are across regions and continents, and how we are all stronger working together to share resources and address common challenges. We are joined today by Ambassador Dina Kawar of Jordan, His Excellency Khaldun Mubarak, CEO of Mubadla Investment Company, and Michelle Nunn, President and CEO of Care USA. They'll be sharing their insights today and their vision for a more healthy, peaceful, and secure future for the Middle East. MEI is also honored to be recognizing two outstanding awardees this year for their exceptional work in response to the COVID-19 crisis the Jordanian digital healthcare platform, El Tibbi, and the Egyptian Food Bank. Their passion and commitment to making the region a better place are truly inspiring. We're also going to be learning a lot more about MEI today and the many ways in which it works to build understanding of the region and foster deeper U.S. Middle Eastern ties. Here to tell you more is the chairman of MEI's Board of Governors, Richard Clark. Clark is a distinguished former U.S. government official who has served in top national security positions for three consecutive presidents. He is also a renowned thinker and an author about the future of security and governance in a world impacted by new technologies and artificial intelligence. Thank you, Vivian. And now, from the library of the Middle East Institute in downtown Washington, to my library here in Rappahattock County, Virginia. Welcome. Welcome to the 2020 Middle East Institute Awards Gala. You know, we're beginning this year our 75th year of existence. And throughout that time, the Middle East Institute has been dedicated to three things, understanding, dialogue, and peace. And despite COVID, MEI has been working hard on all of those things. And we found that working online, perhaps we can even do more than what we were doing before. Thousands of people have come to MEI every week for conferences, for classes, 
to use the virtual library, to use our podcasts and research papers, our institute, journal. All of our activities are more robust than they ever were, thanks to our very creative staff. Understanding, dialogue, and peace. Peace comes from understanding the cultures of the people you're dealing with, mutual understanding between our nation and the nations of the Middle East. Dialogue, people-to-people -people contacts, government officials and everyday citizens talking to each other about their culture as well as their politics. Peace. Peace is the ultimate product that MEI has always stood for over the course of its 75 years. Peace and prosperity between our two regions is something that is achievable. And many of the award winners tonight have been dedicating their lives to prosperity and to peace in the Middle East and to greater understanding between our country and that region. We know you know the importance of that. That's why you support the Middle East Institute. And we'll be asking for, of course, even more support in this, our 75th year. So let's get on with the ceremonies, and let me turn it over to our illustrious president of the MEI, Paul Salem. Paul? Thank you, Dick, for your enunciation of MEI's goals and mission, and for your exemplary leadership as chair of the Middle East Institute's Board of Governors. And thank you to everyone who's joined us here today. Indeed, 2020 has brought challenges around the world, and definitely throughout many parts of the Middle East and North Africa. A once-in-a-century pandemic and contracting economic activity in many countries have created strains in societies already burdened by high unemployment and poverty, and lingering regional tensions have continued to fuel some proxy conflicts in several failed states of the region. But challenging times also lead to innovation, and transformation and inspiring acts of diplomacy and public service. Today, we want to highlight not only how we as an organization have taken innovative approaches in continuing to pursue our mission, but also to share and honor inspiring stories of transformative vision, achievement, and humanity in response to the challenges of these times. I am intensely proud of all that our team has accomplished in this difficult year. Our staff, our scholars, our board, our interns, and all of our experts have gone beyond the call of duty to continue producing top-level analysis and programming. It's a true testament to their abilities and their passion for our shared cause. And I'm excited for what's to come. Here, during our 74th annual gala, we're proud to reflect on three quarters of a century of working to pursue the goals of understanding, dialogue, and peace. These have never been easy goals, and the challenges presented this year are a reminder of how quickly circumstances change. But they're also a reminder of how people can rise to meet the moment. If anything, it's clear that our mission is just as important today as when we were founded almost 75 years ago. At that time, MEI was designed to usher the region through a period that would bring about transformational changes, politically, economically, and culturally. Today. The moment once again calls for us to play a role in framing another watershed transformation in the region and in its relationship with the United States. With this in mind, I'm excited to announce our 75th anniversary campaign called MEI at 75, through which MEI intends to contribute to a new vision to bring about peace, prosperity, and partnership. As always, we count on your ideas and friendship and support. As 2020 nears its end, we look back at a difficult year, but one in which MEI adapted to become more productive and impactful. And we look forward to our 75th anniversary year with energy, with hope, and with optimism. And we know that with your support, we can play our part in building a better future for the region and for its relations with the United States. I want to thank all of today's speakers and awardees, everyone who helped make this virtual ceremony possible, and all of you who've joined us from different corners of the globe. 
Thank you for being with us and thank you for your support. MEI is not your typical think tank for many reasons, which you're going to learn more about today. It's an integrated think tank with three centers that focus on policy, education, and culture. The Policy Center is unique because of its diverse community of experts, many of whom are either from the region or have worked in and on the region for many years. Their policy analysis stems from their deep knowledge of the region and their strong networks among officials, business leaders, and civil society activists. I'm delighted to share a short video about MEI's Policy Center. We've built a top-notch team of over 130 resident and non-resident experts working across 15 vibrant programs. Our goal is not only to analyze what's happening today, but also to help governments, the private sector, and civil society prepare for tomorrow. We're introducing new data-driven methods to better anticipate regional challenges. We're creating a global network of experts to develop solutions to tomorrow's problems. And working to solve the problems of today through dialogue. Whether those problems are long-standing or caused by new rivalries. In the hopes that constructive engagement can reduce tensions. We're building a more stable, secure Middle East by engaging with our friends and partners. And increasing understanding of the evolving threat of violent extremism. We're looking at the interplay between the Middle East and other regions, like the Black Sea region and Central Asia. We seek to encourage economic growth and social equity in the region. And to help build resilient societies at peace with their neighbors. We seek a strong U.S.-Middle East relations based on shared values and common aspirations for a brighter future. And a Middle East where peace and prosperity can be enjoyed by all. It's now my honor to introduce the first speaker of the gala, a distinguished and talented diplomat whom I greatly admire. Ambassador Dina Kawad has served as ambassador of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan to the United States since 2016. Before that, she was permanent representative of Jordan to the United Nations and served as Jordan's ambassador to France. She has been decorated by France, Portugal, and the Holy See. It's a pleasure to welcome Her Excellency, Dina Kawar. Thank you, Vivian, Mr. Richard Clark, Mr. Paul Salem, distinguished guests of the Middle East Institute. It gives me great pleasure to be with you tonight and to be able to speak to you, albeit virtually, and a special thank you to the Middle East Institute's exemplary team for keeping up the momentum and putting together the Institute's 74th ceremony. This annual dedication is meant to honor the region's top visionaries, cultural leaders, entrepreneurs, and philanthropists. I cannot think of a more important time to celebrate their contributions to our societies and underscore the vital need for universal solidarity and innovation as we face the biggest humanitarian crisis of our generation. As His Majesty King Abdullah always says, threats do not come in silos and the solution cannot be in silos. In today's uncharted waters, these change makers we recognize here today and the many more out there are harbingers of hope, offering inspiration to all of us as our battle with the global pandemic can only be won through human ingenuity. My friends, the message I carry to you today from my beloved country, Jordan, is one of hope and optimism despite these difficult times. We know too well how a set of challenges can also become opportunities. History has shown time and again how Jordan, with its limited resources, never wavered from this belief despite all odds. Our efforts to mobilize resources against COVID-19 were from the very beginning centered around three main objectives. First and foremost, the health and safety of our citizens. This was paramount and by far our top priority in the face of an unknown enemy. We enforced an immediate and strict lockdown in the kingdom and it was encouraging to see the overwhelming support and collaboration between the government and the people during this time. Protecting the economic welfare of our citizens was another priority. We swiftly implemented a set of policies, responses to limit the economic impacts of the pandemic. Subsequently, fiscal and monetary measures were immediately put in place, and we established a fund to cover emergency medical expenditures to ensure our Ministry of Health had the necessary funding mechanism in place. 
We invested in affordable and widespread testing, delivered food and necessary items to households, and lowered sales taxes on key protective equipment. The outbreak of the COVID virus created dire outcomes for many businesses around the world. Protecting our local businesses and companies was on our priority list. In a phased-out easing of our lockdown, factories and large companies located in industrial zones and in selected sectors were allowed to resume their operations under strict safety guidelines. It has certainly been a challenging period for all of us, but the silver lining and the rays of hope are there. Because Jordan heavily invested in its vibrant entrepreneurial community and tech sector over the years, we have managed to bear the fruits of that investment during the height of the pandemic. Continuing to invest in digitizing our economy is important to us. We have built a number of platforms, which I am proud to say were designed and created pro bono by our entrepreneurs and startup companies. I was delighted to learn that our very own Al-Tibbi and Mr. Jalil Labadi were being recognized here today. Jordan has also managed to get into the global supply chains during this time. We are self-sufficient in producing personal protective equipment and, in a gesture of solidarity, donated PPEs to the United States. On a personal note, I am hoping that the culture of working remotely may lead to a higher rate of female participation in the economy in the future. Hurdles such as transportation and daytime childcare are no longer barriers, which will allow many of these women to join the labor forces. Again, when one door closes, another one opens. Unfortunately, we are currently experiencing a second spike in COVID-19 cases, but due to the early measures adopted by the government, Jordan is still considered among the countries with the lowest number of cases per capita, highest cure rates, and lowest mortality rates. Ladies and gentlemen, this global pandemic has certainly put our principles, values, and shared humanity to the test. It has revealed how interdependent and fragile we are as a human race. However, through re-globalization, pooling our resources, enhancing cooperation, and certainly setting our geopolitical differences aside, we will not only survive this, but we will emerge victorious. In the end, I wish to congratulate Mr. al Labadi and the entire al tibbi team, as well as the Egyptian Food Bank, a very well-deserved honor indeed. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy your evening. Many thanks, Ambassador Kawad, for your thoughtful remarks. Well, the pandemic certainly has changed how many of us work and study, including at MEI. The Institute's Education Center has been teaching Middle Eastern languages on site for decades, but now, Classes have gone virtual, and today, students from all over the world can take MEI's language classes from the comfort of their own homes. Welcome to MEI's Education Center. We offer group classes and private tutoring in Arabic, Persian, Turkish, Hebrew, and other regional languages and dialects. During the pandemic, we've transitioned to online instruction and our teachers are busier than ever. With online classes just a click away, our language program has expanded beyond DC. And now we welcome students from all over the US and as far away as Singapore. And with our recent accreditation, we're poised for even more growth and new opportunities. You said online, that means you did a good job. It's never been easier to study a language at MEI, and in the year ahead, we look forward to exploring even more exciting ways to build the next generation of Middle East scholars and leaders. I'm speaking to you from the beautiful Oman Library, which is part of MEI's Education Center. It features one of Washington's largest collections of books, rare volumes, and maps on the Middle East. You can also find issues of the Middle East Journal here, the premier academic journal of Middle Eastern affairs. Check out the library when it reopens to the public. It is beautiful. Now moving on to our second speaker of the gala. Care USA is known for its commitment to fighting hunger, poverty, and social injustice worldwide, including in the Middle East. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, 
Care USA launched one of the largest emergency response efforts in its history. MEI is honored to welcome Care USA president and CEO Michelle Nunn today. Nunn has an impressive career in public service. Under her leadership, Care USA reaches millions of the world's most vulnerable. Leading her in a Q&A today is MEI's non-resident scholar and professor of global health and epidemiology at George Mason University, Dr. Amira Royce. Thank you, Vivian. It's a pleasure and an honor to interview the president and CEO of Care USA, Michelle Nunn, today. I've long admired the work of Care USA and of Michelle in particular, and I'm really interested to know more about your important work to address the impact of COVID-19 in the Middle East. Michelle, tell me, COVID-19 has had a huge impact on organizations, and unlike many, care can't transition to field work online. How has COVID-19 changed CARE's approach to doing work, especially field work, in the region? Well, thank you. First of all, it's really an honor to be with you and um, to celebrate the Middle East Institute. Uh, CARE is a 75-year-old organization that has dealt with all manner of emergencies and works in over 100 countries, but we've never dealt with a pandemic, a global pandemic at this threshold. So if you think about our work, we have stood up uh, some form of COVID response in 69 countries. Um, we work in the Middle East, in Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine, which West Bank, Gaza, uh, Syria, Turkey, and Yemen. And so all at the same time, trying to lift up the importance of one, stopping the virus uh, and really stemming its tide. And we've done that through a variety of different efforts, including and with a real focus on, for instance, water and sanitation, something we are taking for granted, washing our hands every day. 90% of the refugees we surveyed in Syria did not have access to clean water and soap. Um, and we've also been focusing on uh, the, what we call the sort of secondary pandemics of the loss of income and livelihoods of hunger. This is at the very top of the list of the, uh, of the women that we're surveying. And we've just come out with the report that says uh, that uh, she told you so, which is basically the voices of uh, 6,000 women who are saying that hunger is at the very top of their list and economic insecurity. And then finally, um, the issue of rights. So gender-based violence, child marriage, access to maternal health. These are all incredibly important and we're working really hard in our uh, countries in our Middle East region to make sure that we preserve the rights at a time of great challenge. You mentioned women, and women and children are a really big focus of CARE's work. How has COVID-19 directly impacted women and girls in the region? And can you tell us a bit about what CARE has done to further minimize the worst side effects of the pandemic to these two important populations? Uh, everywhere around the world, we're seeing those who are already marginalized suffer more. Um, so the disproportionate impact on women and girls we're seeing around the world and certainly in the Middle East. So women and girls are often on the front lines of caregiving within their own homes. They're also on the front lines. 70 to 80 percent of the caregivers um, in terms of health care are women and girls. So uh, we see that they are both disproportionately impacted, but they also have the capacity to be change agents. So just a couple of statistics to give you a sense of what we're seeing and what we're hearing um, in our work. 45% of the Gaza residents in quarantine centers are women, but um, zero of the medical and security staff are women. So um, how do we make sure that women are at the table of leadership? We know that 700,000 women throughout the region are expected to lose their jobs. So women are losing their jobs at a disproportionately high impact rate uh, as a compared to men. And we also know that our health hotlines run by women's organizations are seeing a 20% increase in the region. Um, and on top of that, uh, we know that um, the rates of, of, of child marriage are going up. And, um, and again, 67% of the refugees that we surveyed in the region reported a loss of employment. So extraordinary impacts. Um, I think the thing that CARE is really centering itself on is um, how do we uh, ensure that we lift up the voices of women, that we take into consideration the disproportionate impact that the COVID epidemic is having on them, and, um, and then how do we ensure that women are around the table of leadership when we're addressing the, both the COVID-19 response, but also rebuilding for a more equitable future. 
And we've talked a lot about the immediate impact of COVID-19 and the urgency of the response. Michelle, in the last few minutes that we have here, what else comes to mind when you think about the future and how do you remain hopeful and optimistic? Yeah, you know, I, it is a time of great, um, I think, despair. And, uh, and we can't help but feel that when we read our newspapers and see what's happening in the world. Um, but I have the privilege of also seeing the stories of extraordinary heroes and humanitarians and resiliency. Um, one of them is a family ph physician named Iklas, who is from Syria. And um, she is the, the mother of four children. Uh, she fled Syria seven years ago to Turkey. And over those seven years, she's become a humanitarian worker. And she uh, does the work of our cross-border work into Syria. And um, so she is literally delivering um, services and support uh, in uh, maternal health hospitals. In fact, over the last year, she has um, delivered two sets of triplets as an example, so you can imagine the complexity of that, especially with uh, health infrastructure that is weak already. Um, so she's not only delivering um, health care, but she's um, helping to ensure that women have access to family planning, uh, to the safe delivery, again, of their children, um, to vaccinations. And, uh, and on top of that, she and CARE, for instance, are delivering um, 10,000 masks to our partner Syrian hospitals to ensure that their maternal um, uh, that the maternal and pediatric wards have access to basic PPE. So it's ICLOS that gives me hope at a time um, that those people who offer and are and have lost the most are standing up and standing um, in solidarity with, with their uh, community members. And I hope that we can all kind of follow that example in terms of leadership and resiliency. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you, Care USA, for everything that you're doing. Well, thank you, and thanks um, for your example at the Middle East Institute. Thank you. Here to introduce our next speaker is MEI Board of Governors member Tom Campbell. He's the founder and managing partner of DC Capital Partners. He's also a business leader and philanthropist, and he's been a generous supporter of MEI's work. In fact, he's speaking to us today from the Tom Campbell courtyard just outside the Oman Library. Hello. The United Arab Emirates is often held up as an example of what other countries in the region should aspire to. Few have played a greater role in the nation's transformation and its growth and success than His Excellency Haldun al-Mubarak. We are fortunate to have him here with us today. I know that we all want to extend our congratulations on the truly historic Abraham Accords and the leadership of the UAE in this major step toward peace, stability, and greater economic prosperity for all in the region. For the few who may not know Haldun, please don't Google him. It will make you think he spends all of his time on football. In truth, he has somewhere around, I'm told, 19 titles, which he somehow manages to keep straight. As managing director and group CEO of Mubadala, Mr. Mubarak has led the diversification of the UAE's economy its evolution into a digital economy focused on technology, education, healthcare, just to name a few. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Mr. Mubarak was not lost sight of the future. And Mubadal has increased its investment in renewable energy, automation, robotics, artificial intelligence, and connectivity, just to mention a few. From the successful opening of the UAE's first nuclear reactor to the modernization of the financial sector, to the opening of New York University, Abu Dhabi, how Doom Mubarak has been at the center of progress and change for his country. He co-founded the US UAE Business Council and has consistently worked to strengthen the ties between the US and the UAE. And that just touches on the private sector. He is equally active in the public sector and just as effective as a trusted advisor to the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed on all major policy initiatives. But that's what he does. Perhaps more importantly is who he is. Without getting personal, I would just say that he's a man of great integrity and great intellect. And we're extremely pleased that he is with us today to share his thoughts. Ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency Haldun al-Mubarak. Thank you, Tom. It's an honor to participate uh, in this very important gathering. 
Reflecting on the past six months, it's clear that as a global community, we share an utterly interconnected set of risks and challenges. However, disasters such as COVID are never just destructive, and I believe we can and must emerge with more sustainable and inclusive global systems. The Middle East Institute plays a vital part in that. So thank you for your work and for convening us here today in these very uncertain times. I'll share my thoughts on how we are thinking about the months and years ahead here in the United Arab Emirates. But it goes without saying that we are living in unprecedented times. Just a few weeks ago, the signing of the peace accord represented a historic moment for the United Arab Emirates, Israel, and the United States that creates immediate and meaningful security, economic, and social benefits. With the United States' participation and support, two of the world's most dynamic and advanced societies and economies are creating a linked and powerful engine of progress and opportunity. This will be transformational for the entire region by spurring economic growth, enhancing technological innovation, and forging closer people-to-people -people relations between our nations. Turning back to the UAE and COVID, there's absolutely no doubt that with the most globally connected economy in our region and over 200 nationalities living and working here in the UAE, we have a complex and globally connected recovery ahead of us. It has become clear that leadership and trust counts for a lot in this crisis. So it's point of pride that the UAE has responded quickly and cohesively from the outset. We've always been an agile and ambitious nation and have long been a convener for addressing global challenges such as climate, deadly diseases, and regional security. We're applying that same spirit of collaboration and partnership to the recovery from COVID. Domestically, protecting health, ensuring education continues, and supporting our open economy are priorities, along with medical research and vaccine trials. Internationally, we have responded to COVID-19 by providing over 1,400 metric tons of aid to over 118 countries in need, supporting approximately 1.5 million medical professionals in the process. To me, COVID has been the moment for global leaders and business to demonstrate the values they live and their commitment to contributing to a better world. Our recovery plans will intensify the UAE's role as a forward-looking east-west hub and facilitator of dialogue, commerce, technology, finance, culture, and innovation. Mubadala, as a responsible global investor, has responded to this global crisis by taking action on a worldwide, worldwide scale. Our efforts have ranged from providing digital connectivity to remote communities in Latin America to ensure education continues through to PPE manufacturing for the United Arab Emirates. One example I'll share is Strata Manufacturing, based in Al Ain, here in the UAE. As I think this characterizes the positives that can emerge, Strata's core business is advanced composite manufacturing for aerospace. When COVID hit, Mubadala and Strata formed a partnership with Honeywell to set up a new N95 mask manufacturing line in less than 30 days. It has since produced over 1 million masks for healthcare workers and the community. This partnership is profound for two reasons. Setting this up in less than 30 days was inconceivable in a pre-COVID era. It shows the power of agility and partnerships. This mindset has to characterize the recovery. Secondly, Strata's N95 supply chain spans the UAE, the United States, China, and India. A genuine multilateral effort to get this up and running when countries were restricting exports of vital supplies. It speaks to what's possible if we focus 
efforts on creating a more cohesive global community. To this end, the U.S. is a crucial partner for the UAE. We stand side by side in recovery efforts. It's clear to me that with the headwinds and transformational opportunities we all face today, we cannot afford for the global community to turn inwards. We have to double down on greater global collaboration across business, government, and society. How much we all embrace this as a global community is going to shape global growth, prosperity, and sustainability as we recover from COVID and frankly, generations to come. Here in Abu Dhabi, we're entirely committed to a future characterized by collaboration. Thank you for inviting me here to speak. I hope we can all meet in person soon. Thank you so much for those insightful remarks. MEI's Arts and Culture Center also values collaboration. This past spring and summer, the pandemic forced its programming and exhibitions online. But thanks to partnerships with art institutions in the Middle East and Europe, MEI launched an exciting 3D virtual exhibit accessible to audiences worldwide. The MEI Art Gallery was launched as a place to gather, network, and celebrate the richness of culture from the Middle East. It gives artists from the region, many of them young change makers, a platform to be heard and seen in Washington, D.C., and a way to engage with American audiences. It was painful closing the gallery less than a year after we'd opened, but we moved quickly to transition our work online. We've hosted cultural panels on Zoom and launched a 3D virtual exhibit showcasing the work of Lebanese photographers. We never imagined our first online show would attract more than 20,000 viewers from around the world. We're now getting ready to reopen the MEI Art Gallery to timed visits. Audiences can make an appointment to come see our next show. It's our first open call for art made in isolation during the pandemic. We received hundreds of submissions from all over the Middle East, and we chose the very best. All of the art is for sale. So please visit the show online at the MEI website, or even better, come see it in person. And please consider supporting Middle Eastern artists during these challenging times. Another thing that this difficult year has shown us is the importance of teamwork. MEI is lucky to have an incredibly committed and talented group of interns who've gone above and beyond working remotely and from around the world to play a critical role in making sure it hasn't missed a beat during the pandemic. When I started at MEI as an intern, there were three things I loved most. MEI's professional development series, where we visited government agencies, newsrooms, and businesses, the camaraderie between the interns, and how much I learned in such a short time. We host about 27 interns per trimester, or 80 per year, and I'm disappointed that because of the pandemic, our interns haven't been able to enjoy the same experience of being together in person at MEI's headquarters. But the upside is that now we're working virtually with interns located all over the world and doing our best to give them a really meaningful time in spite of the circumstances. My name is Fatima Al Said. I'm based in Rockville, Maryland, and I'm interning with the Programs Department. My internship with the MEI events team allows me to explore critical issues facing the region, informed by my Sudanese identity and passion for human rights. Hi, I'm Daniel from Manila, and I am interning with the Omen Library. This internship is a deep dive into the world of Middle Eastern foreign policy and will prepare me to eventually make a difference in the Middle East. Hi, my name is Maria Mishaya. I'm a research assistant for Dr. Paul Salem at the Middle East Institute. In the future, I hope to promote religious freedom and acceptance for indigenous communities in the Middle East. I know MEI will provide me with the right resources to achieve my goals. We take seriously our responsibility to mentor and nurture future leaders and experts on the Middle East. MEI wouldn't be the place it is without their energy and fresh perspectives. Please join MEI in thanking them. And please consider supporting MEI's intern program so that we can provide paid internships to these invaluable young members of our team. The Issam M. Faris Award for Excellence is being given tonight to the healthcare platform Itibbi. 
Introducing them is Linda Rottenberg, the co-founder and CEO of Endeavor Global. Endeavor Global supports entrepreneurs around the world with services that help them grow ventures, create jobs, transform economies, and support future generations of entrepreneurs. Thank you to the Middle East Institute for recognizing the incredible work of high impact founders and individuals like Jaleel Alabadi. I have known Jaleel since he was a candidate for the Endeavor International Selection Panel in London in 2012. And back then, Altibi was an online medical dictionary that was introducing the concept of telehealth via text message and was the first in the MENA region to do so. And we believed so passionately in Jaleel's crazy vision to provide an Arabic language digital health platform when no one was talking about digital platforms almost anywhere. And we believed in this so much that we not only made him an Endeavor entrepreneur, but we also invested out of our Endeavor Catalyst co-investment platform in Altibi. It was one of our first investments back in 2012. Fast forward to today, and Altibi has thousands of doctors on its platform and is providing low-cost, high-quality health care to millions. And when the pandemic struck, Altibi was in a unique position to provide help and Jaleel did not miss the opportunity to pay it forward. With the Jordanian government, he partnered to set up a national COVID hotline that was so successful that he was asked to replicate it in Egypt, Iraq, and Sudan. And a few months later, when the Beirut blast happened, Al Tibi provided free telehealth to Beirut residents who were suffering under a strained healthcare system. It is my honor and privilege to present Al Tibi and its incredible founder, Jalil Alabadi, with the Isam Faris Award for Excellence for outstanding efforts to provide quality, accessible health care and for serving as a vital resource and lifeline to families during COVID-19. Jalil, congratulations, and we're so proud of you. Thank you for that kind introduction. Dear attendees, honorable guests, my fellow RD, I would like to express my gratitude to the Middle East Institute and its leadership for recognizing Al Tibbi for the Isam Faris Award for Excellence. It is an honor to be accepting it on behalf of Al Tibbi as an organization, its team that wakes up every day with a commitment to uphold our values, and my family where the dream began. Our core belief was always that we will do well by doing good. We see this as the real drive behind our aspirations as a company. A major inspiration for this belief came from my parents' experience surviving some of the most difficult moments in recent Middle East history, just as I was born in Beirut amid the civil war. Even though my father had the convenient option to become a surgeon in Germany after finishing his studies there, he chose to return to Beirut. He worked with refugees with little access to healthcare. He used his knowledge to save lives in communities where medical expertise was desperately needed. Better health for all became our motto when my father and I imagined a company that would take accessibility and affordability of quality healthcare to a new level. It is our conviction that we are on a mission to help humanity in a very special region, the Middle East. A region where access to good healthcare has long been tied to wealth. Over the years, we began to understand more and more about the needs of every part of the Middle East. We discovered where healthcare spending is mostly out of pocket, where quality is in question, and where healthcare is not accessible at all. Gradually, we started filling the gaps with the help of emerging technologies brilliant minds and amazing advisors. We grew from a simple medical portal of 15,000 pages of Arabic medical content to more than 2 million pages of content. We added GP telehealth services accessible by hundreds of millions of people in the region. And today, through our platform, 2 million people have reached qualified physicians within minutes for a minimal or no fees at all. Some of these people had never had previous access to medical services. This past year, however, things have gotten worse 
in many parts of the Middle East due to COVID-19. The health crisis brought new responsibilities as we work to be part of the solution for governments and communities facing new difficulties on a daily basis. We managed to scale up our services 20 times to satisfy a huge surge in demand while maintaining our standards. We supported government efforts in Jordan and Egypt, taking charge of states' main corona response hotlines in both countries, providing consultations free of charge to people, and expanding our existing network into 12 Arab countries. COVID-19 has shown the world that healthcare as we know it no longer meets our needs. And this was even more accentuated in the Middle East. Here it has become very clear that healthcare systems can benefit significantly from digital platforms that can deliver services remotely and effectively to so many in need. This is the kind of company I'm proud to be part of, a company that believes deeply in the value of what it does. It is a real honor to have Al Tibbi's mission recognized by the Middle East Institute. My team and I are deeply appreciative and we look forward to continuing on our journey to provide better healthcare for all in the Middle East. Thank you. Many thanks, Mr. Labadi, for sharing your moving story. So my country of origin, Egypt, has also faced challenges due to COVID-19. And our next awardee being presented with the MEI Visionary Award immediately heeded the call and took action to help. Here to tell you about their work during COVID-19 is fellow Egyptian-American Ahmed Ahmed. Born in Helwan, Egypt, he moved to the U.S. as a child. He is now an actor, producer, and comedian, and perhaps most famous in the Middle East for his role in the Access of Evil comedy tour. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Vivian. Marhaba, kifik, ahla wa sahlan, salamu alaikum. Hello, people from all over the world. I am so delighted to be recognizing a very worthy Egyptian charity today. As COVID-19 spread globally last spring, so many countries went into lockdown to slow the impact, and Egypt was no exception. And millions of Egyptian day laborers and others suddenly found themselves without income in need of a crucial lifeline. In a country where a third of the population lives on less than $1.50 a day, the Egyptian food bank saw a huge crisis looming and moved swiftly to address it. Led by CEO Mohsen Sarhan, the food bank mobilized additional factories to increase food production, launched a corporate challenge, and took to social media to raise additional funds. With the clock ticking, they organized the resources, both money and infrastructure, needed to feed millions of highly vulnerable Egyptians over the course of two challenging months. Set up in 2006 by Egyptian philanthropists, the EFB works to fight hunger in Egypt through feeding programs, as well as running vocational and educational initiatives. Their inspiring work led to similar food banks being set up in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Today, under Sarhan's visionary leadership, the food bank is looking ahead at expanding into microfinance to build greater self-sufficiency and security among those most in need in Egypt. As an Egyptian American myself, born in Halwan, I know well the many hardships my fellow Egyptians face. And I am so honored to present the MEI Visionary Award to the Egyptian Food Bank. This award is for your deep commitment to fighting hunger in Egypt through innovative programming and for your leadership and mobilizing support for families hard hit by the COVID-19 crisis. We appreciate all your hard work and support. Thank you so much, Mabruk, and congratulations. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Middle East Institute, Richard Clark, Chairman of the Board of Governors, Paul Salim, President of MEI, Ahmed Ahmed, my fellow Egyptian, and everyone from around the world watching us and believing in a better tomorrow. Thank you. And to my fellow awardee, Jalil Abadi, congratulations, brother. I'm so proud of you. On behalf of everyone at the Food Bank and the millions of people who we serve, we do thank you very much for choosing the Egyptian Food Bank for the MEI Visionary Awards. I'm honored to accept it on behalf of the Food Bank and will forever remain grateful. This is a beautiful day for us here and a recognition for 60 days of non-stop effort and perseverance from almost 400 people who chose not to stay at home and chose to rise up 
and provide value for humanity in a time where they were needed the most, will forever remain grateful. Because as much as we're happy and honored with that recognition, what we did is simply the reason of our existence as an institution. And this is exactly what we have been doing for the past 15 years, each and every day, a strong safety net for everyone on the face of this nation, whenever and wherever we are needed. For the past 15 years, we have the responsibility of feeding around 150,000 Egyptian families each and every month, in addition to more than 50,000 hot meals daily for the rising generation in our public schools. But when COVID hit and we went into a lockdown, that was exactly 10 days after I joined the Food Bank as their new CEO. Five million people lost their jobs on that exact same day. And it no longer became a choice for us to continue with our modus operandi. It became a calling for us to fulfill our mission and to fulfill our purpose and to deliver value to Egyptians whenever and wherever they need us. In 60 days and across the 24 hours and across the 27 governorates of Egypt, we merged days into nights to support over 1.5 million families with sustenance packs and over 8 million hot meals in 60 days. And this was accomplished through a historical fundraising campaign that saw over 100 private sector institutions joining forces and rising up to stand behind our cause. In addition to hundreds of thousands of individual supporters who kept giving and giving until our mission was fulfilled. And I cannot end this without thanking our cause partners, a reliable network of over 6,000 grassroots development associations who were and forever will be our bright eyes and strong arms in the field. The Egyptian development sector is strong and the Egyptian development sector is alive and the Egyptian development sector will always be there for our people whenever they need us. And last but not least, I'd like to thank Ahmed Labib, my field operations director, and his wingman Yasser, and of course Khaled, our procurement bureau, and their wonderful teams. I'd also like to thank Agharit Amin, our marketing director, and her brilliant team for making everyone here and beyond hear our calling and hear the voices of the distressed. Our factory workers, my men on the line of fire, my delivery teams, my guys in the fields, and our finance teams who kept us on check and on track each and every day, we are delivering value to Egyptians. I would have loved to thank everyone of the 400 amazing human beings I'm honored and privileged to serve alongside them each and every day, but that would have required a separate video we're proud of what we did, and I'm proud of my team, and I'm proud of the people who allow us the honor and the privilege of serving them day after day. I'm proud of each and every person who stood beyond our mission and supported us, and I'm proud of this day, and I'm proud of MEI for choosing us for this amazing award. Thank you, and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Mr. Sarhan and the Egyptian Food Bank for caring so deeply about those in need. And that concludes today's award ceremony. We missed welcoming you in person this year, but we're hoping to see you again in 2021. It's been such an honor to serve as today's MC, and thank you so much for joining us to hear our speakers and learn more about MEI's important work. Now I'll hand the program back to MEI President Paul Salem. Thank you, Vivian, for your excellent hosting. And thanks to you, our global audience, for joining us today. I would also like to sincerely thank the generous sponsors that helped make this event possible. I wish you all a safe and productive 2020, and we look forward to seeing you all, hopefully in person, at our 75th annual gala in November of next year. From all of us at MEI, thank you for your participation and for your support. Thank you, and Tashakor. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Sefos Kozona.